All right, a word of explanation. So, in the when the when this republic was founded, uh, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and Ben Franklin were a committee that were put together to uh, uh, compose a great seal for the United States. And it's interesting how much the Exodus event showed up in what they did. Now, I'm going to talk about that some towards the end of the sermon, but I wanted to point this out since I have been unable to find a good high-resolution version uh, of this. So what you're looking at um, is Jefferson's uh, half of uh, the one side of the seal. I won't talk about the other side right now. It's a different sermon. Um, <laughs> Um, not, qu not completely, but it is somewhat different. Um, and, and kind of before Cecil B. DeMille, uh, this is Jefferson's version of this long line. And I'm going to get to this towards the end of, the, uh, of, of what I have to say, but I wanted to tell you what it is that is up there. In my new work as director of the Center for Religion and Public Life, I'm paying a lot of attention to how we as people of faith show up in public, especially those of us trying to weave a more inclusive, compassionate, and just American society. As I read the many, many stories in today's news about how religious commitments are playing out in public life, I'm paying attention to the stories they are telling, the plot lines of the drama in which we are all seen as actors. The way religious people, Christians in particular, have either lent our stories to interpret the nation or have given over our stories to be colonized and co-opted by one political party. Back in 1999, I read Walter Brueggemann's Cadences of Home, Preaching Among Exiles, a really fine book. And I know it was 1999 because I write the year and the month in which I read a book in the front of it. At that time, I found his application of the themes and lessons of exile to be compelling. He said exile is a, is a really appropriate theme to explore in the modern world because there's hardly anybody who doesn't feel displaced. Uh, that somehow there was home and now there's not home. Exile, he said, regardless of whether you're middle class uh, uh, or a refugee, uh, is social, moral, and cultural. It's psychic, in addition to everything else it is, bodily and the like. Everyone feels out of place psychically, he said. Grieving and mourning is everywhere, along with anger, as expressed in those words at the close of that powerful psalm. How can we be the people of God in this foreign land, has cried the main line. But there's also that desire for revenge, at least in some. Happy will you be when your little ones are dashed against rocks? Well, sometimes the historical era makes a metaphor and its analogies too problematic. And in the intervening 20 years, that's where I've come to regarding the image of exile. Today's Christian right is different from the days of the moral majority in the 1980s and the Christian coalition in the 1990s. For today's Christian right has embraced a presidential administration and their role in Christianity's story in ways more profound and, in my opinion, much more disturbing than any relationship the Christian right had with President Reagan or President George W. Bush. Around the time of President Donald Trump's election, the pretzel logic began for how the people who railed at President Bill Clinton's character 
have made their peace with President Trump. And they came to interpret the Obama years as their years of exile, explicitly saying so. The Christian right moral order, especially regarding sexuality and gender, was losing to the nation's commitment, always only partially fulfilled, to non-discrimination and equal justice under the law for all persons. And then the way they speak about the president. He's Cyrus the Persian, they've said, who liberated the people from their exile, from their captivity. He's Nehemiah, who was called to rebuild the wall. It's the sermon he heard the morning it was inaugurated. Mr. Trump, you are Nehemiah. Build that wall. Along with Ezra's reforms, remember when Nehemiah and Ezra are paired together, Ezra's reforms, remember, were to separate the people from their foreign wives. Now the Christian right is in Ezra mode. For they want to purify the land of all of us who are pollutants. They have more and more right-leaning Christian nationalist federal judges to help with the work. As the leader of the Senate has bragged. And their message to their followers is, don't let the other side take away those hard-won gains. There's a lot more mopping up to do to complete the work of making America a Christian nation, in which I would also insert a white Christian nation. For me, the rhetoric of exile and return is now colonized by the Christian right, and I can't use it. Again, there'll be another, another era, another time. This, this too shall pass. One of the problems with applying the metaphor of exile to current times, in addition, to, though, to the issues caused by the Christian right, is for me the language of return to home. Brueggemann notes that metaphors are helpful not only because of the analogies that ring true and, and, and seem like they're parallel, parallel descriptions to what's going on now, but also because the metaphor is also different and notes, helps note what is different today from then. Well, here's a major difference. In the Hebrew Bible, home was the promised land. Home was Judah. Home was Jerusalem. Home was where God's temple stood. Home was connected to a particular parcel of soil. And in that case, then, a return to a land of promise made sense. Well, if you believe that America ever was a promised land, ruled by white Christians, meant to be a Christian nation, and America was once that country, oh, you know, maybe before the 1960s, well, you might want to return to the era of Christmas carols sung in segregated schools, overflowing mainline churches, and radio and airwaves full of people who look like Pat Boone and Billy Graham. But for anyone sensitive to what this country has meant for indigenous inhabitants, whose lineage here goes back at least 20 centuries, or for persons of African descent enslaved and brought to these shores over the Middle Passage, the promised land language has always been a problem. And going back is the wrong direction. For America it has been to many of our inhabitants and citizens, either Canaan or Egypt. See, the Exodus event provides a much different metaphor and one I'm much more likely to want to retrieve for where we're at today. Going back in the context of exile means going home. Going back in the context of Egypt means what? Choosing captivity over freedom. Boy, that's a really different going back. Exodus means going out, not back, into the unknown to find a home where we've never been before. In exile, the people were already formed into being a people. They were taken into exile. 
and they were trying to hold their peopleness together. In the Exodus story, the people became a people through the trials of negotiating with God and each other in the wilderness. They became a people through struggle when they did not know where they were going or how long it was going to take to get there. Exodus, I think, can again serve as a metaphor for the nation. Not perfectly, and here are two ways the American story should not resemble in any way the Exodus stories. For in the biblical Exodus event, Pharaoh's men were drowned. They didn't come out into the wilderness with the people who were freed. However, in the American context, one might say that, well, all of us, all of us, and all that we represent, we're all in the wilderness together. Those who were immigrants or descended from immigrants, those who descended from those who walked here 20,000 years ago, those who were descended from persons who survived the Middle Passage, and those whose ancestry includes some combination of the above. For Americans, our situation is, this, is, is if, as, as if Pharaoh and his men joined the children of Jacob in the wilderness and said, okay, now what? The other way that America differs from the Exodus narrative is regarding the promised land. I always love Abraham Lincoln's language about us being an almost chosen people. The U.S. is not a promised land that's in danger of being lost. It is a nation whose promise has yet to be fulfilled. And as the author of the book, The End of the Myth, have, has argued, the nation's leaders for over two centuries thought that they would solve all the nation's problems with more land. Taken from indigenous people, buy it from France, Spain, and Russia, take colonies and peace treaties. And once we fulfilled our manifest destiny of filling out these lands, either our problems would fix themselves, or then we'd get on with dealing with race and injustice and inequality. Except that we've not yet gotten to dealing seriously with our founding issues, those toxic ingredients that were baked into America's first birthday cake. Two recent books say something similar in How Democracies Die, and in Democracy May Not Exist, but We'll Miss It When It's Gone. The authors argue that a genuinely multicultural democracy comprised of persons and communities dedicated to the values of equality and liberty and justice for all has not really existed yet, either here or anywhere. Living in the wilderness as a people needing to be reformed from a white and Christian supremacist nation is our dilemma. Living in the wilderness as a people needing to be reformed into a shared power, multiracial, multicultural, multireligious democracy is our opportunity. This tension and the conflicts between dilemma and opportunity is one way of defining our times. Think of that tension in terms of leadership. If you're trying to rebuild what you think has been lost versus hanging on to what you think you are losing, we're def if, if we are defending threats, we're going to look for the strong man. And I use that language intentionally, man. Allow the strong man to play a, uh, a great deal of authority to keep the beasts of chaos at bay. I mean, Thomas Hobbes and Leviathan is right there. Play on nostalgia. There was a past golden era from which the wrong-headed children of darkness led us astray. Plug the holes in the narrative walls by silencing the histories and textbooks that do not support manifest destiny. Suppress the vote among populations that might challenge the power base that supports manifest destiny. But if you're looking for wilderness leadership for an indeterminate time, not to try to prevent a loss, 
You're going to need a holding environment, you know, where you create tables and do everything possible to keep diverse parties at the tables, knowing they're going to argue and argue and argue with each other. Because only in the holding us together can there be learning and discovering the possibility of any common ground. Leadership that keeps safety and risk in some kind of dynamic tension. Leadership that helps us deal with fears and anxieties, which I would think religious people might have something we could say about that. Dealing with conflict, helping people have actually productive conflicts, not just argue. Keeping the vision, the goal, the hope in front of us. And persons who are, can do what I don't see a lot of in public life, um, but there are models out there. Public versions of confession, penance, and forgiveness. Because remember, those who manifest destiny served and those who manifest destiny ignored or harmed are all in the wilderness camps together. This last point that we're all in the wilderness together is, is one I want to underline and why, why I put Jefferson Seal up there. Um, a lot of us know about Thomas Jefferson as a very complex figure um, who was, uh, seemed both brilliant and uh, as racist as anybody in his, in, in his time. Um, so let's allow that sometimes when we speak, we say more than we know. I think this is the case with this symbol here. It was interesting that he and Franklin agreed that the Exodus event was an important story for the new nation. But they wanted a very different part of that event pictured on the American seal. For Franklin, he wanted the conquest of Pharaoh's army um, and the parting of the, of the, of the, of the sea uh, with the uh, words around uh, the medallion, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. Which Jefferson actually loved the saying. Uh, he put it on his own personal seal. But he took a different place to talk about the new American republic. He put us in the wilderness. That's the, maybe he, he said more than he knew he was saying. The long line of people being led by the pillar, pillar of fire, the cloud of smoke, still in the wilderness. Not the moment of conquest of their captors, not the battle to take the promised land, but the wilderness. That period of learning and unlearning. That period of conflict and negotiation. That period of being formed into a people. That period of great uncertainty, great danger, and great opportunity. Mr. Jefferson could not have imagined how his preferred exodus scene might have applied 200 plus years later to a racial ethnic mix in this nation that also would have been unimaginable to him. Yet there it is, in the wilderness, together. What an opportunity for people of faith to offer leadership. People of faith who think America today looks more like America should be than did the America of the 1780s or the 1950s. Now, on to the wilderness work of equality, liberty, and justice for all. Approximating that means tasting this nation's promise.